hello and welcome to KennyRoy.com. I'm Kenny Roy. This is the lecture for the month of October 2014. I'm very excited to do this one. Um, this was actually suggested as um, a video mail and um, I thought it was such a good idea that I decided to do it as a lecture and uh, to do as many as I can. And the, the, the video mail suggestion was to, they, they said, hey, Kenny, why don't you take some of the questions that are a little bit shorter and answer a few of them in a, in a video mail? That's a great idea. Why not? Um, uh, so Because some questions are, are great, but they only take about five minutes to answer. So I wanted to go through some questions that are still, that are still great questions, but um, maybe, maybe aren't as involved or in-depth that would, they would take up an entire video mail or lecture. So we're going to answer as many as we can in about an hour or so, and um, hopefully get you guys, um, get you guys uh, the questions you need, the questions you want. That's what I'm here to do. Okay. So the way I'm going to do this, so I'm going to um, paste the question into here, right there, and then hopefully when I go like that there it is all right okay so there's our first question so I'll be switching this out um, as we go a question about expressions some parts of the animation require or better solve using simple expressions can you give us a couple examples of expressions that come in handy animating props or doing camera work shakes for example okay well uh, yeah so if you don't know how expressions work at all um, basically the way expressions work is in the expression editor um, you basically use math operations and you can use simple mel to uh, basically um, manipulate the channels, uh, attributes, and parameters of any node in Maya. Um, so basically the way it works is um, if you go to the animation ed editor and then to the expression editor, it will load up uh, the expression editor. And it's sort of a lot like the connection editor in that you can just basically use the channel names to um, connect things. Like so, for instance, um, if I make the um, translate x of this cube drive the scale y of the uh, the cylinder. Um, it be basically look something like this. And you have to kind of do it um, backwards. I don't li really like how the expression editor works in that like you select something and you lose the attribute that you're just working on. So I'm just going to go translate x and just copy it. And so this is the channel, p cube dot translate x. And then I'm gonna go to the cylinder. I'm gonna say um, scale y, okay? So I'm gonna paste this right here. So I'm gonna say, p cylinder one dot scale y equals p cube one dot translate x. You hit create, and then as I move this, it actually drives the scale of that um, that uh, that cube. Now it looks like you've lost it, right? Well, um, you know this piece, this p cylinder's scale. It kind of loads it based on the the um, the expression, sorry, loads the expression based on like what you have selected, so it'll 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 be right here. So um, we can actually um, change this even a little bit more. So its scale is equal to maybe um, the translate x times two. So you hit edit, and then now it's now it's you know scaling twice as fast. Or you could do. Um, times uh, 0.2. Oops, let me just delete that and hit edit. And now it's scaling a lot slower. Okay, so um, basically that, that's how you do it. You the, the simplest way of course is to just select the object and the attribute over here, get it, and then um, typically you have some sort of math operation or equation with an equal sign that, that does that. Um, this person asked about camera shakes. Well, one way you could do a camera shake is to, one way you can shake anything is to basically hook up the translation to some sort of noise function. 
Um, one noise function might be a noise material, and then you would just grab the, um, here I'll just make one really quickly for you, um, texture noise, right? Open up the attributes, and then um, we could key the time, time is equal to one, oops, one, enter, okay. And now if we select this node, um, the noise, here we go, right? We have all of these basic uh, um, attributes, right? So we could connect the noise um, to the translates of this. And I'd done something like this, actually. Um, it's, it's a little bit easier through the connection editor. You can just obviously um, apply math functions to it. Like So for instance, um, see how this is moving back and forth. Well, if I wanted to slow this down, I couldn't do that in the connection editor because the connection editor takes a, you know, a straight one-to-one -one connection. Um, a, a, a another quick way is set-driven key. If you have too many set-driven keys, uh, then you get um, a little bit slow. So expressions are faster than set-driven key, and they're slower than connections. Um, and then you have, obviously, all of these math operations. And under utilities, you have um, switches, inverse, multiply, divide, plus, minus, average, those kinds of things. So um, I'm kind of getting a little bit off track here. but. Um, um, yeah, if you feel like it, go ahead and experiment around and start looking at, you know, expressions to create some of those movements. One thing that I used this for um, actually recently was um, there is this, there is these characters and we have all this animation um, just because it was mo -capped, we had all this animation on their heads. So there's a lot of rotation on their head, but there was no translation on the head. So basically like when your neck you know, turns like this, it's actually the head translating, uh, basically. Uh, it, it, just the way this, the rig was set up, we had to kind of like consider it like that. Okay, so that turned into a problem. Why? Because um, it, it was very weird to see their heads kind of like, like on a pivot and like nothing happening in the neck. So we had to turn that into translation. Well, instead, I wrote a really quick uh, expression that just made it so that if their head turned like this, then it also translated a little bit, okay? And if their head turned like this, it also translated um, a little bit, which actually kind of approximated, sort of, neck movement. So it, I, I kind of put in that fake neck movement by translating the head, and I hooked it up with an expression to the, to the rotation of the head. So um, that's just one way to do it. Um, it's kind of a fun fun um, thing to get into. If, I mean, if you, can, if you do understand it and you do like that kind of stuff, then it's, it's fun to do it. Um, <clears throat> let's see what, let's see what else. <clears throat> okay, here's a good one. Some of these are going to be a lot shorter than others. Um, here's one. How do you make non-floaty moving holds? Well, remember the thing with floaty, with, with moving holds is that the, um, uh, you you want to always like think like what muscles are going to exhaust or tire um, quickest, and those are the parts that are going to be moving the most, and the other parts are not going to be moving as much at all. So um, basically, the point is is that if everything is moving the same amount, it seems like it's floating, right? Like why would the hands like uncurl? as much, right? Because if I, if, I, if I had to hold this pose for 20 minutes, my hand would still be clenched. It doesn't take much effort at all to keep a hand clenched. But to hold an arm up, yeah, that's, that's actually um, pretty hard. So after 20 minutes of holding this pose, my, my shoulder is going to get exhausted and it's going to fall down. So in a, in a good moving hold, the only things that are moving are really the, the big muscles that are holding up the most amount of weight, not the small things. So if your if you're moving holds are really feeling super floaty, um, then it's normally a problem of everything moving um, um, a little bit too similarly. Okay, um, let's see. Let's see, um, here we go. I'm having fun. I hope you guys are having fun. I think it's a pretty fun pretty fun uh, uh, thing to do. 
Okay, here's the next one. How do you make a good slow in or out? Or slow in or slow out? Do you follow some rules to know if it looks good without play blasting it? Um, that's a pretty uh, that's a pretty good workflow question. Um, the way that I like to do um, uh, uh, slow ins and slow outs is to pretty much um, uh, do it in panel and key the pose or the position. So normally like a slow in will have that kind of um, uh, uh, you know, rapid deceleration. Um, a, a good workflow uh, way to, to, to do that. What am I doing with my life? Here we go. Good workflow way to do that is to. Um, I, and I think I showed you guys this on the uh, on some of the walk cycles that I've done, um, which is to go like this. Which is if you have a pose, you know, if it, if it's up here. Sorry, ugh. So if it's up here, then I sometimes I copy that pose to the frame before, all right, and then I just move it back just a little bit. So it has that you know has that slow in, you know where it's um, where it's kind of almost where it needs to be. Well, it's not quite as much of a difference. And then I'll do the exact same thing, where you know basically if this is um, moving a little bit too evenly I'll go to a, a a key and I'll just kind of like squish it one way you can check if you if you really don't I don't know why you wouldn't want to play blast or hit just play on the on the timeline but if you really don't want to play blast an editable motion trail if you go into its attributes um, and you go uh, show frame markers um, you can actually see just how even your your timing is and um, you can adjust it this way if you like um, but seriously, it does sound a little bit like you are trying to uh, get away with a little bit, maybe a little bit too much. Um, also, you can modify the tangents. <sighs> um, and let's see, show tangents. Why is this not working? Oh, there we go. Why is this out tangent not there? Oh, whatever. Anyway, um, so you can select this tangent and um, um, play with the timing there as well. really bias this up here okay um, but um, truly honestly the amount of um, work that you're doing that like where you can like skip checking it that's very 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 low it's very it's very rare to not be able to not have to check um, you know you work in here and there um, honestly I'm not sure if I have really any workflow tricks to not watch your stuff at speed. I pretty much, I mean, you've heard me repeat multiple times, you know, how, how important it is to watch your work at speed. Um, so, yeah, I'm just trying to think. Yeah, it's kind of hard to uh, think about that. All right, let's see here. Okay, this is kind of a question that. Um, I, I, there's another one sort of like this. Um, I'm going to try to find it also. Um, let's see here. Uh, check this out. If you want to make a character flying or diving, are there tricks or things you have to take into account? Um, yeah, this is a good question because um, pretty much the physics of doing um, any of that stuff, you, you almost have to invent. Um, by diving, I imagine you mean like diving off of like a cliff like like diving through the air um, um, and you keep on this is the same animator that asked this question as asked the last one um, you keep on saying tricks um, tricks implies I mean sometimes there's stuff that we can do that that really does actually bypass bypass a lot of work um, but there's not actually tr any true tricks to the um, um, to, to doing like character flying. If what you're asking about is doing a character like Superman that can like hover and um, um, what you have to take into account there is that it, it, it very quickly looks completely weightless. Um, and so what I like to do, uh, and this is whenever I have a character that is um, somehow suspended in the air no matter what. So let's say they're hanging from a rope or they're being held by like a giant creature or um, whatever. Is anytime they do any big um, body movement, 
um, they're, they're taken that way um, just a little bit. Um, and, and you don't do it like opposite because this is like zero net effect, right? If you just go over here and it, it, it's, it, it kind of feels natural to want to oppose that motion so that um, um, it's almost like there's no friction in the air, sort of like, you know, Newton's law equal and opposite, right? Because that's what would happen in space um, if, you, if you went like this in space you would you would just be basically doing like a push up in 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 the middle of space you know uh if you were sitting on a um an office chair in the middle of space i mean it's hard enough to do this on an office chair in the in in uh in uh you know on earth but if you're sitting on an office chair and you took a book and you like swung it this way it doesn't matter how slowly you you swing it back the other way, you will bring, you will bring yourself to a total stop um, uh, when you come back, right? It's just equal and opposite. So um, I guess that kind of actually lends itself to that um, amount of uh, uh, floatingness that you get, right? Because in space, everything is t totally weightless. Is the idea? So at any rate, so I like it to make, I, I like to make it so that like, if there's any big gesture, even if it's like this, you're like, I don't know, whatever. Like you take the whole body. If it's like a, you know, Superman kind of like floating character, and you go like this, you know, you like it kind of like takes them just a little bit. There's just that little bit of um, movement in the body that feels like everything is, um, um, everything is still heavy. Like the arms are heavy enough that like it, it, it makes the body move. Um, um, so that's, I guess you could call that a trick. I don't know. We'll, we'll have to leave it to the animator to decide if, if what I, you know, what, what I just said was a trick or if it's, or if it's not. Um, let's see here. Here's a good question. Okay. All right, it says, I got a mouth pose that I really like. It's just the teeth look off from a camera angle. Do you often cheat and move the teeth around or do you take the time to repose the mouth and make it work? Um, absolutely never, ever, ever animate the teeth ever. That's my, that's my rule. Um, it just looks weird. It just takes a, uh, uh, you know, one pixel off and for the audience to be paying, a, you know, pretty close attention to really make it feel like it's totally unrealistic. And when we're, you know, at the end of the day, when we're trying to convince audiences, when we're trying to, uh, you know, suspend, <clears throat> sorry, when we're trying to make them suspend disbelief and really kind of bring them into our world, show them some really awesome animation, it can be super hard to, uh, to get them back once you, um, once you uh, lose them. And I, I just imagine, anything more than just like a pixel um, adjustment to like um, teeth position, you're, you're just gonna get in trouble. Um, especially if it's like in the middle of lip sync because like the mouth closes and then it opens and like the teeth are like not where they were like a second ago. Um, and, and very, 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 very slight adjustments can make it feel like that. So I just say never, ever, ever touch the teeth um, really um, ever. Um, the exception, the exception to the rule would be characters that are so cartoony that, like, um, their teeth is almost like um, is, there's like no like model sheet for their teeth. Like, so for instance, there's characters that are so cartoony that they like you know they have like normal teeth, and then like something happens and they go like this, and then there's like a flat like wall of like white across their mouth. You know, like, what are you doing? Oh, nothing. Ding! And, like, it's not their teeth that were there a second ago. It's, like, a wall of white. Um, if it's that cartoony, obviously that's an exception to the rule. But for the most part, if we're talking the general stuff that most clients look for, which is the Pixar slightly pushed realism style, um, don't move the, t the, the teeth kind of ever. Okay? All right, here we go. This is kind of a good one. This one is... Uh, one of our stalwart uh, question submitters. Okay. 
Uh, it says, for the most part, we are taught to block in step mode, but from what I've heard, it's that some directors can't stand step mode because they have to see the shot in spline. How do you adapt to these situations in a way to quickly get to spline while keeping your shot neat and tidy without making it difficult on yourself to come back and make major changes if need be from the director's notes? Is this where copied pairs comes to play, or is there an other more efficient way. This is a really nice um, in-depth workflow question and, and, and it has a very super simple answer which is that you have to do what you have to do in order to get your work approved because at the end of the day it's going to be you stuck there at midnight literally at the end of the day and um, um, whatever the director says goes. So um, your workflow is going to um, sort of like uh, grow and change um, from 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 project to project, and and uh, sometimes some you know uh, definitely studio to studio, but sometimes like you know even even project to project, or sometimes even within project, um, you might start getting notes or um, feedback based on like what happens. You know, uh, like one shot was sent to client, and then it comes back, and now like everyone has to do this one thing. Um, I've normally heard that happen um, for good reasons. Like for instance, it was. Um, I uh, can't remember what project was on, but that some, some work was sent out and um, there was like a little bit of like uh, like wiggle or jiggle on the elbows when the characters were running or something like that. And then the client said like, oh, we love how, you know, the arms are moving. Can we put that in all the shots? And then it's like, yeah, okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you're if you like to block in stepped and the client can only look at things in spline, it means you need to tune your workflow to get to spline um, a little bit quicker. And maybe you can make up for that time by um, by uh, um, uh, leaving yourself a sort of enough leeway to do some. Uh, editing when notes come back, it might mean that you don't get enough po uh, enough. It might mean you don't get as many poses, literally number of poses in um, themselves, you know. And but the the only thing I can say is that as you um, grow and as you do more and more and more and more work, the simple fact is you will get faster and faster and faster. That is the fact. That is just how it works. So. Um, I, yeah, I, I think you guys know my story of how I developed my lip sync uh, workflow, which was I was working on a job and I had to do, I had to finish about 30 seconds of lip sync a day. And it was just necessity that made me just take my workflow all the way down to just two passes. Open, close, narrow, wide. Open, close, narrow, wide. And 85% of the time, my work was approved the first time the producer saw it. But, you know, I had so much more to do, it didn't matter. So I said to myself, okay, well, that is now, I, I sort of like, in my my mind, I, I'm like, oh, well, this is now the, another way to think of it is, it's not 85% of the time it's approved, it's that open, close, narrow, wide gets you 85% of the way to f your finished lip sync. Um, the rest is just like 15% of it, so... Anyway, so, you know, obviously I would, would have wanted to do a lot better uh, lip sync than I was able to do at 30 seconds a day, but um, that was what the, the job called for, and that informed my, my workflow that I use today, okay? Let's see here. <clears throat> okay, let's try this. Mm, okay, hold on a second. Okay, here's here's a good uh, uh, question. I think this one makes a lot of sense. Oops. My computer wants me to save it. I don't want to save it. Don't make me save it. Okay, here we go. It says, I hardly ever do thumbnails in your simplified workflow checklist. It's the first thing on your list, even before shooting reference. I usually shoot references and then maybe thumbnail to exaggerate poses. Other than that, I'm not really sure. What are the benefits of thumbnailing? Okay, this is this is a big one for me, and I think that um, I think this kind of touches on a, uh, 
a very important topic, especially considering that we're talking about animating with tempo. What animating with tempo um, does is it sort of puts the onus of getting your, your great poses um, on on you in your planning stages and really, really, really exploring and pushing and taking, you know, some risks with those poses before you start um, um, blocking with tempo. The reason I say it like that, um, the reason I say onus is because you, I feel like we get posing for free, but it, it comes from something. It doesn't come out of nothing, meaning like if you do your due diligence and you plan really well I, I think start with thumbnails if you can um, because you'll be able to thumbnail like your thumbnail is like your best case scenario if there wasn't such thing as a rig that's definitely going to break at some point if there wasn't such thing as like you know 3d space that I can I can bend and stretch to my will and and you know make work however I want if there weren't all of these constraints that we have to work within then this is the pose that I would want I really want this one and you t you you thumbnail it you have it and then it's there and then then you go into tempo and in tempo you're kind of saying like my pose is already sorted and I kind of get them for free okay so I'm going to now do focus on and really work on the part of the animation that deep down is going to be more impactful and effectual when when the audience watches it that's the timing when you have that timing though and you go to put in those those poses you have to have good stuff to ha to to work with right it can't be it can't be weak and it can't be you know uninteresting and and poor silhouette and 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 uninspired okay so I think that's why thumbnails make a big difference is because it's your dream scenario. It's your best case, wouldn't it be great if I could get all of these in, all of these poses that I've, I've come up with, right? Um, um, you know what I mean? And in, 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 in a good way to, to sort of like draw an analogy between what we're doing and and, and and you know the bad way to do it is the good old fishing analogy where I say animation is like fishing in that you can't push you know towards where the fish are you have to cast over the the fish and then you have to reel it in and that's that's how you get to where you want to be it's impossible it really is to just push a little bit and 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 really get everywhere you want to be um, that goes with everything in animation but specifically maybe I should break it down right now it, it, it that that applies to timing that also applies to posing okay so you know the traditional like you know three-point stance you know Iron Man lands on the ground and you know it's like left foot right foot and like like fist okay well, if somebody hadn't thought of that pose beforehand, do you really think that they would put him in that pose um, and, and like naturally if, he, if they were just animating him land on the ground? Even if it was with great, great timing, would they ever get there? I think they would land and, yeah, maybe put his hand down, but then if if they were just working with like the the timing that they had and hadn't planned that pose they would have like a pose that needs strengthening and needs to be pushed and then they would try to push it and push it and push it and push it and push it rather than that what if you had like an ultimate goal that maybe isn't even achievable in terms of like the strength of that pose that you've drawn and you're like man if it could look like this then we'd be in great shape so that's the thing. And then um, the second part of that question that I want to sort of speak to is that, yeah, it's the first thing because I don't want my thumbnails to be kind of dumbed down um, from what I've seen and absorbed um, subconsciously from watching or performing my video reference. Um, I can't, you know, jump off a 50-story building and land on the ground and crack the concrete with my Iron Man three-point stance. I can't do that. So um, I, I do my thumbnails first and then my reference, and then I search around for reference so that um, what I, what, you know, my, like, really inspired choices um, stay that way. Don't get colored by what I see, Okay.
Um, let's do a couple more quickies, a couple more quick ones. Um, here's, a, here's a quick one. It says, um, is pose to pose recommended for quadruped animation or is it better to approach a quadruped and more layered workflow? Um, I really enjoyed uh, doing the uh, update to the quad walk uh, called the, the quick quad run. Um, where I showed you that um, basically a run is the exact same thing as a walk. You just pick your stride length, the amount of frames that your foot is in the air and on the ground, and just offset them all. And you can basically pick any footfall pattern that you want. It doesn't matter. It could be a walk, a run. It could be a diagonal walk, um, like a lizard. You know, left foot um, back and right foot forward move at the same time, and then the opposite. It could be lateral walk, which is like dogs and cats, um, whatever. Um, so definitely pose to pose is not recommended for quadruped animation. It's not rec um, recommended for any cyclical animation actually at all. Um, at Animalia uh, a month ago, I actually showed the animators how a fly cycle could be um, created entirely um, uh, not even looking in the viewport when you're uh, making, your, uh, making your motion. Um, that is like creating the motion on the controllers that you know you need and then put positioning and sizing it um, uh, where it needs to go after the fact. So there's basically no posing, real actual posing going on. It's just all of the um, channels like overlapping and cycling off of each other um, that, ma that makes that motion. So again, basically as opposite to pose the pose as you can possibly get. <clears throat> Um, let's see here. Okay, cool. Um, this goes slightly into uh, the uh, sort of a question that I answered a little while ago. Um, but um, so check it out. Um, so this is I have a rigged character and I want to make changes to geometry for certain poses like pushing the cheeks down and angling the eyebrows. Try to create a lattice but the deformation got funky when animating the character. Do you have any tips on adjusting the geometry after it is skinned? Um, there's something called um, uh, input or deformation order. What it basically says is that um, there is an order to things. Everything doesn't happen at the exact same time and you are um, liable to uh, manage that when you're working um, so that uh, things don't get um, a little bit funky. So I'm just going to show you guys uh, exactly what that means. Uh, I'm just going to subdivide this just a little bit so you guys can see. And here we have um, our stuff. Okay, so I'm going to duplicate this and put it right here. And now I'm going to skin this thing Um, animation, make a joint right there, and now let's skin, bind, skin, smooth bind, and now let's add this as a blend shape, and now let's deform this like that, little devil horns, and now we don't need that. Okay, so now we have a skin cluster and a blend shape, and it actually, unfortunately, it is being a little bit of a poo-poo poo -poo brain because I actually want it to be in the order that I gave it. Okay, so anytime you add any def def uh, deformers, it adds it to the top, except blend shape because blend shape knows that it's supposed to go under the skin cluster and it's being such a bum for, uh, for, for that reason. Okay, so I'm selecting my joint right now. Let me x-ray joints. Okay, so I'm selecting my joint right now and I can move it around. And this is what's happening when you're in animating the character, right? Joints are moving geometry around. Okay, so it's not parented. This is actually skinned. It's using the skin cluster. It's a deformer. All right, this object, its pivot is still at home. Okay, see there's its pivot right there. All right, these are actually the vertices being being weighted and and deformed by that 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 joint. That's very important to remember. Okay, so it's being moved around. If I try to um, dial up the blend shape now. Oh, it actually um, reaches through. Oh, good for them. Good for them. They fixed that. Well, let me add a, a, a lattice instead. Let me add a lattice to this. Okay, so now we have a lattice. And let me actually 
me do myself a favor and just scale it up so I can see it. Okay, so now we have a lattice. And if I move this lattice point, I gotta turn off reflection. If I move this lattice point like this, there is the um, object, right? Even if I group the lattice and parent it to the, um, to the bone, so it's moving along, even if I do that, oh my goodness, this is all working. Let me just let me move the base here. All right. Well, what's actually really really nice to see is that the all of these inputs are actually working correctly now. Let me see there. Base. Oh, it's because I parented it. All right. Well, let me just make this this one point. Let me just undo all of this. Let me just make this one point before I embarrass myself any further. The point I'm trying to make is that the order of your deformations um, actually does have a um, an effect and if I if I hadn't my lord if I hadn't based if I hadn't um, parented this um, it would have all these crazy um, these crazy deformations okay if you go into inputs and then go into all inputs this is how and where you um, you reorder your your inputs okay so basically what I actually want it doesn't seem to matter because Maya has worked some stuff out. Actually, it's only it only worked with the blend shape because they must have worked that out, and it only worked with the the lattice because I actually changed it. But it would be I would want the blend shape to happen first, and then the lattice, and then the um, skin cluster. What that means is is that anything that happens to the blend shape happens first because it's lowest. So let me add. Let me take the um, lattice down, okay? Go to the blend shape, all right? So I'm, I'm turning up the blend shape, okay? Okay, there's those spikes. Then I'm turning up the um, lattice, there's the back part, and now I'm moving the joint. And you see how it doesn't get all screwed up because you, it, it, you think, oh, it, it should be screwed up because it's traveling outside that lattice. No, 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 no. Just imagine this. That lattice is is all happening, and it's all sort of like getting done. It's all complete before this joint then grabs onto the vertices and moves them all at once. Okay. If I if I grab this again and I put the lattice after after that skin cluster, what happens is think just think about the order, okay? The skin cluster is grabbing all the verts and it's moving it, and then it's walking up that uh, input order and saying, "What happens now? Oh, the lattice moves it. Oh, well, it's moving outside the lattice." All right. So why is that important? I know that was a really roundabout way of, of, of going about trying to answer this, but what you need to um, look for is the input order. So all you basically have to do is grab your object and drag middle mouse underneath the skin cluster and make sure you're doing it to your character in their bind pose so that they're at home. All right. If they're not at home, then what ends up happening is this skin cluster is <clears throat> it's going to be the, the weighting and like where things are moving is going to be a little bit messed up. Well, it's going to be way messed up depending on um, depending on where you uh, how far away from their their bind pose that they are. Um, but you just got to make sure that that stuff is is all kind of taken care of. Okay, so everything underneath your skin cluster. It seems like they figured out a, like a customized way to make it so the blend shape can be anywhere, which is weird because. Well, I guess they just know. Blend shape is always before skin cluster, so it looks like it doesn't matter right here. But at any rate, uh, yeah. And so you can add, I, I do this commonly. I, I, I make little tiny customizations to, to rigs all the time. Um, and I, like, you know, even when I download, right? All you have to do is when you add that blend shape, select your, your, your object, just make sure it's all underneath that skin cluster because the, the movement of the joints and the controls and all that stuff should be the last thing always. That's um that's calculated, okay. So it's a re that's a really cool question. I'm glad you sent that one in. Um, let's see here. Uh, another one from the same animator. I think it's a good one. All right. 
cool. Uh, it says, when giving animation critique, do you have an order of things you look at, f look out for, and talk about kind of like a workflow? I love the idea of a workflow for critiquing. Um, I'm going to answer this sort of like from the um, standpoint of a recruiter. Let's say that I'm looking at um, um, animation for um, the the purposes of of telling how good of an animator you are. One of the first things I look for these days is, are you animating on more than one axis? Okay, um, I, I said this in a video mail. It was the tip I gave in a, in a free YouTube video a, uh, a few weeks before CTN last year. Basically, I just said, if you're not animating in more than one axis, then, then you're not getting the whole picture, buddy. Um, I see way too many um, demo reels and even like practice shots. I mean, if you're doing animation to get better and to really improve your, 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 your skills as well as kind of show off, then you need to stop doing things where like people are like walking like in a straight line or fighting in a straight line or, or running or, or, or talking to each other. And maybe they're like at a 45 degree angle, but it's just the camera. You know, if they're taking a step forward, it's like you've rotated their master controller. Like if all of the odd angles and interesting like composition you've you've ever done is like trickery of camera and you've only animated your character forward and back in Z, then um, you, you know what you have to do next. You know what you have to start doing right now. You have to break that character up, make them feel really super free in all 360 degrees and start doing a lot more sort of like physicality where they're moving around. They feel free and open, you know, to sort of like explore this space. Um, I gave a, um, um, I think the, the um, there's one called helper objects or, or super physical helpers. I can't remember which one it was, but it was, I think it was after tempo, but before, um, um, my second my second tempo lecture just lo look back for it um, super physical helpers I think it, I think that's the one where I talk about how like helpers like are basically how we are going to be able to get really quickly to that sort of like that freedom in, 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 in all directions <clears throat> all right, let's see here Oh, okay, here's here's an interesting question that um, I don't think I, I ever 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 would have uh, uh, thought to ask myself, but I, I want to answer this one now. It says I know that improving animation skills involves not only with animating a lot, which is obvious, but also with watching and analyzing motion, working on my own storytelling or improv skills. How much should I animate and how much analyze? What is more time consuming and more important to master my overall animation skills? You know, this reminds me of a story that my painting teacher when I was um. Um, learning um, illustration in college um, told me where he said that he went to the library and he started um, copying all of like Michelangelo's work. Let's just say it's Michelangelo. It might not have been him, but the story kind of holds up no matter who you pick. Um, um, copying all of Michelangelo's work and the idea was, you know, he was going to learn how to, uh, you know, be as good as Michelangelo by um, copying his work. So he would go in there and he was copy, copy, copy all these drawings and whatever. And he told me that at one point, like, you know, he had copied this one drawing like a dozen times and it didn't matter how, how hard he tried. He just, there was just like a je ne sais quoi, there was just something missing from it. And he ended up narrowing it down to this one simple thing because there was no explanation for why he wasn't able to um, um, copy um, the drawings perfectly. Because, he, I mean, he worked like 12 hours a day for like 10 years doing this, okay? It, was, it turns out that Michelangelo is, is left-handed. Maybe it's not Michelangelo. Doesn't matter who it is, but that was, that was the, the the sort of the punchline of the story. Turns out this this um, this painter was left-handed. I thought it was very 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 funny um, how something so small could have such a, a large impact. Um, uh, well, uh, I mean, to this guy at, at how well he was learning and how well he was sort of improving his skills in in sort of like a metered way. Um, I thought thought to myself like what if that was me and all I was doing was trying to like copy work and I found out that I was never going to get the the je ne sais quoi the ultimate sort of like the satisfaction of knowing that I perfectly copied it and therefore at least have the technical skill to do what like uh, arguably one of the, ma the you know the the most impressive masters of uh, of art has has ever done 
and then when I imagined this, I was like, wow, probably this guy could have stopped about two years in and gotten all of the real technical practice that um, he ever needed. And then it was time for him to do his own work. Um, maybe not even two years. I mean, he's doing all, obviously a lot of other stuff and not just spending, you know, um, all his time just, just, just copying art. But the, the point was is that um, as, as impressive as uh, my teacher was, his um, method of or his idea of how to um, get there technically I just really, really, really disagree with it. And I thought it was a very sad story how uh, I, I can just imagine him, you know, reading or finding out one day that uh, Michelangelo is left-handed and just and then just looking back and seeing, yes, it's just like just the, the, tight, the end of that one pencil stroke just curves to the left and not to the right or whatever, whatever it is. Um, anyway... Um, so, um, so, so to a little bit more specifically answer your question, um, yeah, I mean, I do a lot of analysis. I do a ton of analysis, but I think that the analysis that you need to do needs to be sort of balanced among more broad forms of art and not just animation. Like, to be honest, I watch animation and I'm really delighted and excited when I see great animation, but I don't sit down and frame through um, animation anymore at all. Um, I am more interested in what impression that the, the animator wanted to give and what was the thought behind that? Why did they, why did they go, go with that choice and how did they don't, how did that choice dawn on them? If someone looks like they get punched, but like the, the arm looks like a, you know, like a, like trombone, like where did that come from? Are they a trombone player, or were they, you know, listening to classical music when they did that? That's more interesting to me, um, and I think those kinds of those kinds of uh, questions really fuel you as a, uh, more as an artist, and not as much as as a technician. Um, plus, the more you watch too closely. Uh, uh, on like a like a frame by frame basis, or the 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 more analytical you get, the less creative you get, and that's just the truth. Because um, if you see somebody do a zip out, and you like you get really analytical, as in like you're like, um, you know, two frame anticipation, and then three frame hold on that, but the first frame and the third frame of that hold on that anticipation are the exact same. And there's only a tiny little bit of wiggle on, on that middle frame, but you know, if I take out that middle frame and I look, they're the exact, the exact same. All right, so maybe that is. I'm not arguing that that's not, that, that might not be true, but, but if that is a, a component property of like the best you know, zip out that's ever been animated, I, I, I don't want to know. I'd actually rather not know mathematically and sort of like analytically how they did that. I'd just rather be inspired by the choice. I'd rather be inspired by the, the sort of the impression that I've gotten. And then I'm going to work and I'm not going to stop until I give somebody else that impression. Or I watch my work back and I, I get you know as excited and inspired by what I, what I just saw somebody else do. You know, I don't want to know the secret. I don't want to look too much under the hood. Um, I'd rather just um, sort of let the art inspire me and the art keep me going. okay? So um, that's kind of how I feel about you know balancing um, working on animation and working on, uh, or, or just analyzing stuff. <clears throat> um, that's one question. 
How are you guys liking this? You guys having fun? I'm having fun. Here we go. I would like to know how locomotion works for games. More specifically, how does the workflow work? Do you animate a sequence, then cut it up? Or would you animate each part, each part separately? Basically, there's two different parts of a, of a game. There's the cutscenes or the, or the um, cinematics. Basically, any scripted motion is going to be animated almost exactly like it is in film. You're going to have like you know a beginning and an end, and you just animate it together. If there are... Um, you know, um, actual like cuts in, in in the camera. Normally, those cuts actually aren't in the um, the um, the um, animation itself. It's just the camera actually snapping to and moving to a different place, which means that your animation actually has to work in 360 degrees, and um, it ha there, there's really like no cheating, right? So, guy enters, walk you know, walks through the gate. And then he walks over to like this house or whatever, and like you know, first shot is like he's up on the, um, you know, uh, you know, camera's like up on the roof of the castle. And he walks to the gate and turns, and then the camera goes down here. Normally, it's the camera actually moving down there, and you know, it's the exact same animation as it goes. There actually is, pardon me, actually are tools to make it so that the. Um, characters um, can actually you can actually have sort of like cinematic cuts I mean I know in Unity because I've been experimenting with Unity there are tools to make actual like cinematic cuts and um, and and sort of like edit together sort of like a you know more of a cut scene but um, in general um, it's um, it's um, if you're doing like an in-game scripted action it's just like it's just like film um, then when you start getting into the you know you know, camera goes down, it fades to black, and then it comes back up, and it's it might be an in-game rendered, like an engine rendered um, cutscene. There's obviously going to be a lot of different scenes, and it's going to be again just like um, film, where you know you have a beginning and ending of your shot. Um, in the rest of the game, though, the engines have ways of blending together motion, and as long as you um, have an engine that understands like uh, um, bone, you know, joint chains and um, and hierarchies and stuff. Basically, you are animating each action to blend nicely into the next action. Um, there's something called um, states, where uh, basically you can't do the running jump action from the sitting motion, for for, for you know from the sitting pose. So you first have to have your character stand up, and then there would be somebody that if your character is sitting down on the ground, someone would animate, they would take that pose that's in the engine already of the person sitting, and they would animate them standing up and getting into the standing pose. Now let's say that you get up and you're holding down forward so that you're, you're walking. There probably is, in most engines, in Unity at least, but in most engines there's ways to make it so that the blend points kind of cross over. So you can actually have them stand up and they don't actually come to like a stop in the standing pose. They would stand up and kind of like cruise through that standing pose as they take that first step. But at any rate, that just depends on the en the engine. In general, the in-game animations are very, very, very short and they are, um, they are um, blended together by the engine. That doesn't mean that like the scripted actions are like that. Um, you don't have to build a scripted action or, or a cutscene or anything like that um, from the components of the, the, the in-game animations. Meaning, if you have a character sitting on the ground and the direction of the cutscene is that, oh, they stand up and they turn to your character and they say, like, I'm going to leave, and then they turn and leave, you don't have to basically have sitting on the ground and have them stand up and, and hit that you know, in-game standing pose. You just animate it like normal. Okay, so in some ways it's 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 um it's a lot like film these days, and they're trying to make the tools and the look you know as cinematic as possible. I mean they've always been going for that, so um, I wouldn't worry too much about it. It's something. The bottom line is it's something that you can get used to. It will be explained to you on your first day, and you can get used to it in a week. So you'll figure it out. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if you're headed to a game studio, but I just want to let you. Here we go. This is a hard one. This is a really hard question. I, I've debated answering this one for a long time. What is your favorite animated character in a film? 
and why. Um, it's hard to it's hard to answer the question because I um, the animator in me really wants to choose a character that is you know really super well animated, but you know the nostalgia factor and, and whatever really wants me to pick something that um, sort of like I feel like affected me in a huge way. That would probably be. Um, any of the characters from the last unicorn we had that we had that on VHS when I was growing up and I must have watched it you know at least a hundred times um, the the Red Bull like the Red Bull like scared the living crap out of me but I couldn't look away it was like it was like a car accident and the whole film you are seeing her nightmare of the Red Bull coming and and then in at the end of the movie he like lives up to he lives up to like the terror it's like exactly like what she imagined and um and he's there and then just like how powerful it is when she you know stomps st- towards him and her hooves and then he's backing into the waves and like like the wave hits him and like it makes a sizzling sound if i if i can remember correctly and like he he just he just you know He's so big, but she she forces him back there. I mean, I probably for me that was like one of the most like insane, like emotional and powerful things that I'd ever seen. Also, the Great Owl in Secret of Nim. Um, um, I get because I I really loved the Secret of Nim because it it, it kind of didn't. Um, it was like very scary. Um, it didn't care that um, the like some of the characters were going to scare you to death. Um, the great owl, like covered with cobwebs and the glowing yellow eyes, and and there's like there's like like mice skeletons all around. If I remember correctly, it's like she's like walking through like like basically the skeletons of of like probably like people you know mice she knew like going up to this 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 owl, and you see and you're like oh my god is he gonna eat her right now is she dead? Anyway, so I guess um I guess I have to pick you know characters like that. Um, if I'm if I'm going to be just talking about like nostalgia and, and, and whatever, um, those affected me the most. Um, if I'm going to talk about animation, I would say that probably um, probably Buzz Lightyear is is um, probably the best animated character. I mean, they've had a lot of time to get it right. So, um, but I just think probably across the three films. Um, he has the sort of like the most endearing style to him, sort of the, you know, the militaristic, but also sort of like, you know, action figure, karate chop, you know, let's, let's, let's go this way, that kind of stuff. Um, really fantastic choices on the part of the animators. Obviously in Toy Story 3, Carlos Baena's, um, you know, Spanish buzz, um, I mean, obviously that, I mean, Carlos is, is one of the greatest, so, uh, you gotta, you gotta hand it to him there. So it's really good uh really good question. Let's do one more. Let's do one more. <clears throat> the same animator asking for tricks again. <clears throat> I don't know, I'm sorry, I, I, I guess I'm I'm talking more than I, I normally do in a, in a uh, in a lecture. Maybe I'm, I'm animating normally, and then uh, for this one I'm talking. I'm like, my my throat is getting really sore. Okay. All right, let's try this one. It is. Um, when animating two characters in a shot, I understand that you can only focus on one character. Is it okay to keep the second character sim- simple and to have some? longer holds uh yeah absolutely um to to speak to that point though what i would say is that the um the um i think jason schleifer um maybe he said it maybe he was quoting another animator but it's a tennis match all right with with the eyeball the audience's eye can only look at one thing but that means that you need to know exactly what they're looking at it's not enough just to keep them simple because the audience might check in with them and if you don't have enough going on that's kind of leading the eye back to the character that's talking then you you might lose them so what i would say is is that instead of um instead of keeping them simple all the time give the audience the okay the go-ahead 
to to check in and, and, and look over. So if you're if they're if you have them talking and you have the one character say like, um, um, uh, you know, I went to the uh, party and 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 you know I use a password you gave me and they didn't let me in. Right, this person's the talk the one that's talking. But when you went like this, just on the other character, have them like kind of react a little bit to it, you know, just like a, l like a little bit of a, uh, of a nod, you know, not big, not, you know, not scene grabbing, but just in case if what you do is this and the audience goes back over here, you don't have, the, you know, the audience kind of like getting orphaned over on the side of the screen. It's like, oh, he's acknowledging, and this is all subconscious going on in the audience's mind as well, but it's like, oh, yeah, he acknowledged it, he nodded, okay, you know, that, that, that gesture was not, you know, ignored, and then they, then they just come back, they, they, they come back to the, to the guy that's talking, okay? So, really, bottom line is that if you animate it, like, pretty realistically in terms of, like, the way that people interact, you'll probably be okay, you know? So, um, yeah, so don't take... Uh, don't take all of the motion out of them and don't like really force them down. I've seen that a lot where the one person's speaking the other one and the other one's just like, like stiff like a corpse. Um, that's bad. Um, have them react in, in a small way to all the offerings that the one character gives them. And also, just to speak on another point, I see a lot of two-character dialogue sequences where you don't have any reaction shots. And reaction shots are a big part of film. So <laughs> don't be afraid don't feel like you're cheating if you're not showing the character that's speaking all the time it's fine to show the characters listening and 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 sort of reacting if you don't do that then the audience doesn't ever know not to look at a character to react um and you'll lose in like in the in the in the two character the two shots you lose those eyes again okay you gotta train your audience you got to give them you know enough that they uh that they don't get lost, right? Give them a little bit of a, a roadmap on how to follow your animation. It'll be okay. Um, that is it. That's about an hour. Um, I enjoyed this. I might like maybe once a year. I'll sort of clean out a little bit of the uh, of the uh, ask video mail uh, questions and uh, and and do another sort of like rapid fire like this. I I really enjoyed this. I hope you guys did too. Um, these were based on ask video mail questions again that I, I don't think that would last an uh, you know the length of a, a video mail. These are like four or five minute questions to answer, but. Um, um, great questions nonetheless. So thank you to everybody who uh, sent these in. If you recognized your question, I, I really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to leave it at that. I'm Kenny Roy. Good luck with your animation, as always. Rock on.